While a few clubs like the Reds, Astros, and Expos continued to insist upon clean upper lips, mustaches were sprouting like dandelions everywhere else by the mid-70s. At times, it almost seemed like a flamboyant mustache was the de rigueur accessory for the top relief pitchers of the day. In addition to fingers, Mike Marshall of the Los Angeles Dodgers, Sparky Lyle of the New York Yankees, and Al Roboski of the St. Louis Cardinals were all top firemen with fearsome fuzz. For Marshall, who often spoke out against what he perceived to be the game's antiquated approach to physical training and conditioning, the Fu Manchu mutton chops combo he wore was simply another expression of his individuality. Ditto for Lyle, an incorrigible prankster. His party piece involved taking off his pants and sitting on birthday cakes of his hapless teammates. His outsized walrus mustache also served to hide his mischievous grin. But for Roboski, the mustache took on an almost talismanic degree of importance. The most exciting member of a Cardinals team that slowly sit, slid into mediocrity as mainstays like Bob Gibson, G Joe Torre, and Lou Brock got older or retired. Roboski was known as the Mad Hungarian, thanks to a highly entertaining mound act that involved stomping around like an angry bull and muttering to himself and fixing the batter with a homicidal stare before finally throwing the pitch. My controlled hate routine, Roboski said of the ritual, which he performed before every pitch. <laughs> During a 1974 contest with Chicago, Cubs third baseman Bill Madlock tried to get under Roboski's skin by imitating the pitcher. As Roboski was about to go into his windup, Madlock stepped out of the batter's box, retreated halfway to the dugout, and began to stomp around and mutter to himself. <laughs> Roboski watched the comic performance impassively, but when Madlock finally returned to the plate, cards catcher Ted Simmons delivered his review in the form of a right hook to Madlock's face. <laughs> <laughs> Through a combination of good pitching and sheer intimidation, Roboski became one of the most dominant relievers in the National League. But in 1977, his mustache and Simmons' long raven locks ran afoul of new Cardinals manager Vern Rapp, who insisted that all his players be clean-shaven and wear short hair. I didn't come here to be liked, announced the defiantly unhip rap. I'm not trying to treat the players like little kids. It's just that they haven't been accustomed to discipline. Today it's do your own thing, be a free soul, live for today because tomorrow never, may never come. But reality has got to come sometime. After initially threatening to file a grievance through the Players Association, Roboski grudgingly ditched his Fu Manchu and proved remarkably less effective without it. His ERA ballooned to 4.38, leading St. Louis sports writers to speculate over whether the pitcher's true powers lay in his arm or in his mustache. At the end of the season, Roboski was traded to Kansas City, where he regained both his mustache and his impressive form in 78, saving, saving 47 games and posting a 2.88 ERA. That's actually a typo, that should be 27 games, but you know, it's hard to get good copy editing help these days. <laughs> With the exception of Dick Allen, African-American ballplayers of the late 60s had mostly been reluctant to go natural, or generally emphasized their own blackness in a sport that had been integrated, kicking and screaming at that, just two decades earlier. By the mid-1970s, the Afro had thoroughly permeated American popular culture. Rose, froze, anything goes, trumpeted the TV ads for Afro Sheen, a model that was finally starting to apply to a large number of black baseball players as well. Predictably, these hirsute expressions of black pride made some of the white folks in baseball's boardroom squirm with discomfort. Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher Doc Ellis, never exactly a shrinking violet, didn't mix well with authority figures, a trait that once resulted in a face full of mace, courtesy of a Riverfront Stadium security guard. Ellis regularly gave the baseball establishment fits, most memorably in July 1973, when he appeared at the Wrigley Field bullpen before a Pirates Cup contest with his hair and curlers. Ellis's superfly hairstyle had recently been featured in a photo spread in Ebony magazine, and he needed the curlers to create said do. When word came down to the Pirates Clubhouse that Commissioner Kuhn and, and Pirates owner Joe Brown were both concerned about the potentially adverse effect of Ellis's curlers upon baseball's image, Pirates skipper Bill Verdon gently took his volatile pitcher aside. Look, Doc, I don't care what you wear, Verdon told him. But the front office doesn't like it, the umpires don't like it, and if you're not careful, you're going to get fined. Ellis agreed to ditch the curlers, but not before venting his frustration over the situation to the sporting news. There are many black men who wear curlers to help their hair, he fumed. Baseball is getting behind the times again. Four or five years ago, they wouldn't let player, players wear mustaches, goatees, long hair, or long sideburns. Look around now. To another reporter, he added, they didn't put out any orders about Joe Pepitone when he wore the hair paste down to his shoulders. 
After he retired, Ellis would reveal that his infamous curlers had been, had been about more than just self-expression. That's when I was throwing spitters, Ellis told Donald Hall, offer of Doc Ellis in the country of baseball. When I had the curlers, my hair would be straight down the back. On the ends, there would be nothing but balls of sweat. Ellis would reach back between the pitches and get a little grease on his fingertips, just one touch at a time. By 1975, most major league rosters boasted at least one player, like the Cubs' Jose Cardinal, the Mets' Nino Espinosa, the Red Dodgers' Reggie Smith, the Phillies' Gary Maddox, and the Cardinals' fabulously named Bake McBride, whose, whose oversized afro would have caused them to be mistaken for a member of the Spinners, the Shy Lights, or any other fantastic contemporary act that appeared on TV's Soul Train. Maddox, whose mutton-chop sideburns were nearly as puffy as the hair on his head, spent parts of 1969 and 70 seasons serving in Vietnam as a U.S. Army infantryman. During his tour of duty, Maddox was exposed to various chemicals that left his facial, hair, facial skin prone to rashes. Though he was one of the first major leaguers to wear abundant chops, they were less of a fashion statement than an easy way to protect his sensitive face from the glare of the sun and the irritation of daily shaving. Louis Tian, Boston's inscrutable Cuban hurler, went his contemporaries one better after the 1975 World Series when he commissioned a custom-made Afro toupee to cover his balding pate. The bespoke hairpiece, which cost El Tiante a cool $750, was created by none other than Monsanto, the same chemical industry giant that manufactured artificial turf for Major League Stadiums. <laughs> Perhaps the crafty pitcher was merely seeking a competitive edge. If any batter had lined a screamer back through the box, Tiant's turf tube probably could have deflected it to the nearest infielder. Baseball's most awe-inspiring Afro unquestionably belonged to journeyman slugger Oscar Gamble, who is, of course, well represented on the cover. To this day, Gamble's 1976 Topps traded baseball card is still prized by many collectors, not because of its rarity or Gamble's abilities, but simply because it showcases the biggest, most thoroughly badass Afro to ever appear on a major league diamond. <laughs> A native of Raymer, Alabama, Gamble came up with the Cubs in 1969, then spent a couple of undistinguished seasons with the Phillies. It wasn't until his trade to Cleveland Indians in, the 19, in the 1973 that he and his afro truly blossomed. From 1973 to 75, Gamble averaged 18 home runs a season as a platoon player, all while sporting a voluminous afro that added a good four inches to his height and appeared to measure, measure as much as two feet across. Gamble typically crowned his luxuriant growth with a cap several sizes larger than what he would have normally required. In truth, he probably could have fit two additional caps on the afro pipes that protruded from either side. And his powerful swings would often cause batting helmets to pop right off the precarious perch on his head. I had a lot of pitchers want to throw a ball at my head to see if it would stick in my hair, he later recalled. Gamble was traded to the Yankees prior to the 1976 season and was immediately informed by manager Billy Martin that he would have to have his hair cut before he could be fitted for pinstripes. When Yankees public relations man Marty Appel turned Gamble's shearing into a media event, Gamble, ever the reliable role player, endured the publicity stunt with typical good humor, though his wife Juanita wept as she saw her husband's due reduced to a more conservative circumference. But Gamble would have his revenge. Traded the next year to the Chicago White Sox for shortstop Bucky Dent, Gamble slugged 31 homers, a significant increase from the 17 he hit for the Yankees in 76, as his hair returned to its earlier jaw-dropping abundance. As writer Dick Young noted in the Sporting News, Oscar Gamble, returning to Yankee Stadium with the White Sox, took pre-game batting practice bareheaded, no doubt to flaunt a flourishing afro that he was made to trim down on a member of the Yankees. Alas, Gamble would have to get his fro trimmed again in 79 when he returned to the Yankees via a mid-season trade with the Texas Rangers. But by then, the oversized afro was beginning to fall out of fashion, a development surely not lost on Gamble, who owned a hip discotheque, Oscar Gamble's Players Club, in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> there would be no place for badass afros in Ronald Reagan's America, and Gamble's dynamite dew was ultimately fated to fade into legend. Referring to the circus-like atmosphere of the Yankees' clubhouse, Gamble once uttered the immortal line, they don't think it... Let me start that one over again. They don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. <laughs> For a few years in the 1970s, those words could have easily applied to his unbelievable hair as well. <laughs>